It's April 2014. A 15-year-old is waiting nervously beside a football pitch in the Norwegian city of Drammen. That day, aged 15 years and 118 days, Martin Ødegaard became the youngest footballer ever to play in Norway's Tipperligaen. It's January 2021. A 22-year-old is waiting nervously beside a football pitch in the English city of London. Seven years have passed, and Martin Ødegaard has failed to live up to the early promise he offered. It's a dream come true for me. It's unbelievable. To think that I am ready for the best club in the world is an honor. Moving to Real Madrid and being loaned to clubs around Europe, he's spending the rest of the season at Arsenal in a bid to kickstart his career. Martin, welcome to Arsenal. How does it feel to have joined the club? Thank you very much. It feels great. Uh, yeah, it feels amazing to be here. In this episode, we ask, whatever happened to Martin Erdogan? I think as a Norwegian, he was the first of these talented kids now to come through and he presented, I think, to many the first real chance for us to have our own slot on. Mats Lochert is a Norwegian football analyst. From the outside looking in, Norway probably seems like a, a winter sport dominant country, winning basically everything at the Winter Olympics. But in reality, it's a football country, even though climate and you know international success wouldn't suggest that's the case. So for us to be presented with a chance to finally enjoy that which others have enjoyed for, for a long time, that was massive. So when did you first become aware of Martin Erdogan? I think I first became aware of him 2012 when he made his first team debut for Stremskutze in a mid-season friendly against Mjandal. That's not a game I would have watched, but he was literally 13 years old debuting at the senior level, and that's going to make headlines. Interestingly, his father was the assistant coach of the opposing team at the time. I don't know if that played into him playing. Maybe he was able to tell his team's players to go easy on him. But that will have made the news. And also he, around that time, had stints visiting and training with Bayern and Manchester United. So how quickly did he become a household name in Norway? He became a household name on April 13th, 2014. And I can pinpoint that date because that's the date when he made his debut in the Norwegian top division. I would say overnight, but it happened on the day. Because he not only came on at 15, which was the youngest ever in our domestic league, but he also made a quite significant impact once he did. <laughs> he came on in the 72nd minute and he assisted a goal before the game ended. And I think that he was likely front page news before the, the ref blew the whistle. So tell us a little bit about his earliest exploits in football. His father, Hans Erik Erdegor, was a footballer too, wasn't he? He was. He was a professional footballer. He played for the same club Martin did here, as well as Mjandal. So he was active from the mid-90s until early to mid-2000s before he retired. He wasn't a star player, but he did stick around for a while. So he was an established professional, but he was never as good as his son was, probably even at 14 years old. So he retired in 2007, and shortly after he co-founded the football section of Dramanstrong the youth club that Martin ended up playing for, from which Martin left for Stremskutze eventually. And his son, he was clearly gifted from an early age. Like, he played in regional and national competitions with 13 and 14-year-olds at 11 years old, and he stood out. 
And at age 12, he basically starred in a competition featuring a lot of the nation's top under-16s. It's strange talking about his development because everything happens on such an accelerated timeline for him. But he leaves his hometown team, Drummond Strong, at the age of 11 for Stromsgutse, as you said. How important a move was this for his development? I think it's a natural pathway going from your local team into a, a bigger team locally. So I don't know if it's the pathway that necessarily stands out as important, but rather, like you said, how quickly it all happened. He signed there at 11. I'm sure he trained with them before that. At age 13, he was basically in the first team squad. And at age 15, he was, you know, a starter and a star player. That's probably mostly down to the outstanding once-in-a-lifetime quality of the player. But you got to give some credit to the club as well. Because I don't feel like that would happen anywhere, regardless of how talented the player is. So how much of Erdogan did you get to watch when he was in Norway? Quite a bit. He didn't stay here for long, but he did make his debut quite early on in his uh, first and and last season in the top division. And he did clock in nearly 2,000 minutes. For the second half of the season, he was a starter, uh, and he was an influential one as well. So it's not one of those cases where you have a youngster who who gets some time to to play, get some minutes, and you go like, oh wow, that, that kid's got something, he could be really good one day. Because he basically got the chance to play and instantly turned out to be one of the best players in Norway at the age of 15. At the end of the season, he was voted by basically any outlet that did a team of the season. He was, he was voted into it. So how would you describe his play style? What stood out for you about the way that he played? I think it's all rooted in his outstanding technique. He has a lot of qualities. He's obviously incredibly calm, composed. He's got an eye for a pass and, you know, all those qualities that you could say that any modern and talented 10 has, but it's all just rooted basically in his technique. Everything that he is good at is a result of the comfort he has on the ball, which is probably down to the thousands upon thousands of hours that he spent by himself on a plane of grass. So in 2014, Erdogan played the full 90 minutes for the Norwegian national team against the United Arab Emirates. And again, he was 15 years old at that time. How important has his place in the national team been for his reputation in Norway? I don't think it's been important for his reputation. I think his reputation was solidified basically after the 18 minutes plus stoppage that he played at 15 in his debut. I think more so it's just nice for Norwegians, especially at the time that he was at Castilla and didn't really play much to get to see him. Obviously, when you have a player like that, uh, what appeared to be a a once in a a lifetime prospect, you want to see him with the, the flag on his chest. And so in that regard, it was nice, but I think his reputation would have been fine either way. The reputation of national team managers who were to keep him out of the squad would suffer more. So what was the response in Norway when the news of Erdogan's move to Real Madrid broke? Excitement, obviously. But I also think, and and I know because I was one of them, that there was disappointment among some. He was essentially wanted by every single club that could feasibly get him and present an offer that he would be interested in. He and his dad, as it turned out. There were many clubs that probably presented a better and clearer pathway to the place where he wanted to go than Real Madrid. But obviously, we don't know what he was told, what he was promised, and what exactly they offered that made it also um, tempting for him. So tempting, in fact, that he chose it over clubs like Ajax, like Bayern Munich, like Liverpool. So it's been six and a half years since he moved to Real Madrid, and he only has eight appearances for them since joining. How do the Norwegian fans feel about that move, given that it seems on the face of it to have not been as successful as people maybe wanted it to be? Speaking for myself, not great. That's been the case for a while, though. I think most Norwegians were probably unhappy as early as 2015, when he was essentially stuck at Real Madrid Castilla, with seemingly no prospects of being loaned out. Of course, that happened eventually, and he did get loan moves, but not necessarily the ones we wanted. And I do think, even now, maybe even especially now, that we saw how those loan moves turned out, that he was ready to play at a higher level than the Spanish third tier, even then. 
So I think Norwegian fans are probably not super happy about it as a whole. Hopefully, he can play as well as we saw him play last year, where genuinely, until lockdown at least, at Real Sociedad, I think you could make an argument for saying that Martin Odegaard was the best player in the whole of La Liga. It's hard not to fall into the trap of getting too effusive about young talent in football when there's still a lot of development to go, but how would you rank Odegaard amongst the exciting prospects Norway has been putting out in recent years? At the time of breaking through and making his debut, becoming famous nationally and internationally, he was number one, and at literally any other time in Norwegian football history, and probably for most countries even, that would have been the case. But right now, there is this kid at Dortmund that you might have heard of, who, who takes a lot of the spotlight away, which is good, don't get me wrong, because Martin has had too much of it for a, for a while, which probably hasn't been good for anyone. But he is firmly top two. <laughs> as a star and as a profile, at the height of the hype, might have been even bigger. But it's hard to compare now, because you have this other kid who one and a half years younger is already basically a global superstar and somehow just turned into the profile that we hoped Odegaard would be. There's a sense in which Odegaard functions as more than just a player though and represents Norwegian football as a whole too, isn't there? Well, at this point we're almost spoiled for uh, super promising kids. But when he first came through, Norway had been starved of an icon, a footballing hero for, well, basically my entire, at least, adult life. We had players at Manchester United who were good in their own right, but none who broke through at this age, none who, on talent alone, stood out, even internationally. And so he he had to carry, basically, Norwegian football on his own. Even now, when you see Erling Haaland turning into a superstar uh, in Germany and in the Champions League, he's basically tagging on to the promise that Martin gave. And he's part of a brighter generation rather than the symbol of it, which is what Martin was for a while. The elephant in the room when it comes to Erdogan is his underlying knee issues that have plagued him in the last few years. Could you tell us about that? So from my understanding, he's been diagnosed with patellar tendinopathy, also known as jumper's knee. There is no common consensus on how to best treat it. Some saying to rest, others saying to stretch. There are definitely those who will say that it's more about pain management than actually trying to sort the root issue. With it being chronic, it's uh, unlikely to ever go away. And I guess we'll never know when it's going to flare up, when it's going to affect him, and, and to what extent it'll affect him once it does. I also feel like... The fact that his injury has, to an extent, gone under the radar might have hurt his reputation because you have people who don't necessarily realize that he was injured or that he was playing with an injury and who just think that his play dropped off naturally. Or even worse, people look at his full season output not knowing that half of it was incredible and the other half was basically dire because of this thinking it averages out to a good, not great season, which I guess mathematically is correct, but it misses a lot of the nuance. So how do you read Erdogan's future from this point? I think a large part of it will be defined by his knee. He was one of the best players in La Liga, the half season basically that he got to play before the injury even arose as a problem. I think if he manages his injury, he could still be one of the defining midfielders of his generation. But at this point, given the nature of his issues, it seems like it's a matter of how it affects his career, and not if. At 16, Martin Erdogan made the move to Real Madrid. To find out more about this spell in Erdogan's career, I spoke to Om Arvind, managing editor of the Managing Madrid channel and the host of the Las Blancas podcast. Martin Erdogan has been a Real Madrid player since 2014. He's played eight times for them since joining. Does he even feel like a Real Madrid player at this point? 
I think I've always thought of him that way, regardless of whether he's been a part of the squad or not. Maybe that's down to the protectiveness Madrid fans have for him in response to the over-the-top criticism he's received from day one, like saying his move to the Bernabeu was a mistake, or that he was greedy for money, or that he didn't get along with his Castilla teammates due to the status difference. Attacking a player is a great way to get a fan base to rally around and feel strong emotions for said player, so I think Madridistas have always felt like Odegaard is one of us. What was the general consensus at Real Madrid when Odegaard arrived? I think there was a lot of skepticism. Carlo Ancelotti famously said that it was more of like a PR move in terms of like the transfer and people just really weren't quite sure what to make of Real Madrid signing such a young player, it being such a big deal in the press, right, with him courting so many European clubs. And then all the rumors started to come in about his wage, about how he'd be training with the first team instead of Castilla, despite playing with Castilla, the youth side. And so a lot of Real Madrid fans weren't sure what this meant, whether Real Madrid were making a smart decision. This was the very beginning of Florentino Perez's shift to this youth signing transfer strategy and Real Madrid fans weren't really aware of what that was at the moment so there was a lot of people who didn't really think that this was going to work out that felt that Florentino Perez was you know doing something stupid again but I think because as I mentioned before with like so much of the press attacking him it just kind of automatically got Real Madrid fans on his side and I think by his second Castilla season and by the time he'd gone out on loan most Real Madrid fans had got over that initial skepticism and had, I think, just decided to back him all the way. So how would you say that consensus has changed around Erdogan since he arrived at Real Madrid? Real Madrid fans are convinced of his quality. Maybe there are some particularly hardcore Zinedine Zidane fans that, in the effort to kind of defend their manager, now believe Odegaard isn't good enough or something. But I'd say the vast majority of the fan base are pretty convinced of Odegaard's quality, right? So whatever skepticism about Oh, is this kid good enough? Are we doing the right thing? Everyone's sure that we did the right thing in going out to get him. The question is over, can we successfully integrate him into the squad or not? And that's kind of where the disagreement lies. But most Madrid fans believe this kid is absolutely special. And in hindsight, we kind of bless Florentino Perez for making this decision to go out and get him when he was so young. Look up, Marino into Odegaard, controls with the right, takes the shot, and with the left, it deflects into the corner, and Real Sociedad are ahead, 57 and a half minutes in, and the home side lead. Since arriving at the club, Odegaard has gone out on four loan spells, culminating in the most recent move to Arsenal this January. How do you read those first three loan spells to Heron, Vane, Vitesse and Real Sociedad? It was a case of Odegaard being managed very cautiously, Till date, I don't think Real Madrid's management have taken as much care and had as much patience with the young signings loan spells as Odegaard's, probably because he was the flagship signing of Florentino Perez's youth project. Real knew the scrutiny the kid and thus the club would face, and they wanted to ease him into the big time as much as possible. They maybe overdid it with the Vitesse loan, as I think he probably could have played in La Liga that year, but you could see clear, steady progression as a player from Heron Vane to Vitesse, to Real Sociedad, where he evolved from a precocious yet inconsistent talent to an elite game-on-game difference maker. So after returning from La Real, Odegaard was given a chance this season by Zinedine Zidane. Why do you think it didn't work out? Surprisingly, given who he was as a player, Zidane doesn't prefer number 10s and advanced playmakers. He'll make exceptions like with Isco, but that requires a formation change because he doesn't want that kind of profile out wide or occupying one of the interior roles. So when Zidane used Isco heavily to end both the 16-17 and 17-18 seasons, it was in a diamond. And this season, Odegaard has only gotten starts when the undroppable Casemiro has been absent, meaning the formation changed to a 4-2-3-1, or in a diamond, as was the case versus Real Betis. And this is despite Odegaard having thrived as a right central midfielder in a 4-3-3 with Real Sociedad. So Zidane's tactical rigidity in this sense combined with the fact that Madrid's form turned around with Luka Modric's renaissance in the 4-3-3, effectively froze Odegaard out of the 11. So also not to mention that Odegaard has had to trade the rare number 10 minutes available with Isco. (laughs) 
how are you viewing the Arsenal loan? Do you see it as being a big opportunity for Erdogan to work his way back in at Real Madrid or is it more of a chance for him to showcase his talents for other teams so that he can move on in the summer? So I'm slightly nervous because it's a case of Odegaard moving from one laborious possession-based team to another. He's a type of player that can make a huge difference for you, but only if you play a bit more vertical and with a slightly higher tempo. If you just stick him in your side without any structural adjustments like Zidane did, he can look disconnected and ineffective. I'm hoping that Arteta uses him the right way, giving Odegaard a chance to show Zidane why he needs to do the same, but I really have no idea if that'll change Zidane's mind or not. I'm sure the rest of Europe will be scrutinizing this loan move heavily in the event that Zidane keeps to his old ways. So do you think that Erdogan can ever succeed under Zinedine Zidane? Or will he have to wait for another manager to come in before he can achieve that? Predicting Zidane is impossible. Every time you think you understand the man, he changes something. But two things that have been consistent with him since day one is his view on certain player profiles, as I discussed before, and his style of possession play, which is horizontal, low tempo, and incredibly concerned with ball security and retention, leading to a wing-heavy style that produces a lot of crosses. If those factors stay the same, then Odegaard will never succeed under Zidane. At this point in time, how good would you say Odegaard actually is? If we take his 2019 Real Sociedad form as reflective of his current ability, he's bordering on world class. He's an absolutely elite ball progressor, both in his ability to receive in tough positions and pass, he consistently gets players into the penalty area, is great from set pieces, and is a strong chance creator. But what makes him truly special is that receiving element, where he gets the ball in the half turn between the lines, collapses the defense around him, and then gets the opposition scrambling backwards with the good forward pass. He essentially creates transition situations from regular possession play. So how do you read Erdogan's future? Will it be a career that leaves us wondering what could have been? Or do you think there's still time for him to come good? I think he already has come good. It's a question of whether he can continue to do so. If he gets game time under the right coach, the only mitigating factor is his knee problem. But I'd bet on him to overcome that and have a fantastic career if the prior conditions are met. Matt Lockert is a Norwegian football analyst. Om Arvind is the managing editor of the Managing Madrid channel and host of Las Blancas podcast. The music for this episode is provided under the Creative Commons license by Blue Dot Sessions and the details for the individual songs can be found in the show notes. This episode was produced by myself and Josh Schneiderweiler. I'm John McKenzie. Thanks for listening to Football Today.